We're very fortunate today to have J.R. Hernandez with us. He's been doing the information security for over 10 years. He's currently a, uh, uh, a security manager at Evolve Security. And in his spare time, he likes uh, photography, literature, and stand-up comedy. And Hello everybody, welcome. My name is J.R. Hernandez, as I said. Uh, this is going to be a talk about large language models for newbies. So I, I am a newbie to the field as well. We'll go into that in a little bit. But uh, welcome. Thank you guys for coming. Appreciate it. Uh, so what's on the agenda today? So we're going to talk about what LLMs are, um, how they work, and how to train them, and then the future what it holds, right? Um, as you guys know, uh, you know, LLMs kind of took over a year or two ago. Everybody kind of went crazy. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you guys why that experience made me decide to do this talk. Okay, so who I, who I am and who I am not, right? So uh, I'm a security manager. I lead a team of pen testers, um, you know, at, at Evolve Security. Um, yeah, I, I was a, formerly I was a penetration tester myself. Uh, I've been in the InfoSec space since I started my career uh, around in 08. Uh, lifelong noob, I'm proud to say that. I'm always trying to learn new things. Uh, technology and security in general is very, uh, you gotta keep learning. It's part of the job, you know, it's always something that you gotta keep on top of. So this is one of the things that I'm trying to do for myself to stay relevant. Uh, what I am not, I am not an AI expert. Uh, I'm not a data scientist. I'm not a machine learning researcher. I'm not a mathematician. So I'm just a security guy who found a new technology and is trying to understand it and learn it. Uh, and I want to make sure that our AI overlords, I understand what they want. Uh, <laughs> um, all right, so uh, why have this talk, right? Uh, well, because um, there's a lot of unknowns about large language models, ChatGPT, about AI. It's very scary, right? So I wanted to understand what it was. I, I didn't want to be scared of the thing, so I wanted to see, like, how does this really work? So that's the thing that made me decide to do this and research this topic. Um, as I said before, learning new things is part of my job. I have to stay relevant. Uh, in order to secure LLMs, I have to understand how they work, right? So that's, that's the big motivation here. Uh, all right. Uh, so what are LLMs, right? Large language models. So uh, large language models are basically AI models that understand uh, natural language and then generate it as well, right? Um, so here are some of the common things that they do. Uh, they generate code, review code, uh, generalize text, summarize text, translations, um, the most popular one are chatbots like ChatGPT, um, sentiment analysis, and much, much more, right? Uh, and you might be like, hey, you used the word model to describe large language models. <laughs> That's not fair, right? Well, I did that for a reason. Uh, I'll tell you guys where that is. Uh, because it's not something that you can kind of, it's kind of like a Russian doll situation where I have to go back and go back and like explain all the layers before I can kind of, so you can kind of get a grip of what um, an AI model is. So let's start with artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is the field, kind of like physics, it's a science field, right, that kind of focuses on getting machines to perform tasks that require human intelligence. Um, the next level down is machine learning, which is a subcategory of artificial intelligence, which kind of focuses on how we get machines to learn, right? Uh, the typical problems that we see with machine learning are classification and predictions, and they do this by uh, analyzing uh, text and, and getting these algorithms to get the machines to learn. Uh, a subcategory of that is deep learning, right? Which is uh, getting them to solve harder problems and they do this by mimicking the human mind. Uh, mimicking uh, the, how the neurons in our brain and synapses connect so that we can learn. Um, this is kind of where deep learning comes from and we created something uh, called artificial neural networks, which is basically how the human brain learns. And we did this uh, in order for it to solve more complex problems. Uh, and then from that study of <laughs> Uh, deep learning, we have general AI, which is like the buzz and what everybody's here for, and ChatGPT and Dolly and uh, MidJourney and all these tools that are using neural networks to create new content, not just let us know if something looks like something else. This is actually creating new content um, based on training that has been done. So that's kind of why I have to say AI models to explain uh, <laughs> that what um, large language models are. Um, yeah, it just, there's a whole bunch of fields that eight, all of these fields are you know, disciplines and studies that people spend their whole lifetime learning. So this is my attempt to kind of dive deep into that. All right, so like I said, a large language model is basically this, it's a function. Uh, this is as much math as we're gonna do today. Uh, <laughs> this is it, right? 
Uh, all right, so let's explain what that is, right? So f of x, it's a function, that's the AI model. X is the input, Y is the output. So basically, Llama 3 is an open source, like ChatGPT equivalent. You give it a prompt, which is your text, which is your input. It does its magic, and then it gives you, it generates new text, right? They basically, a lot of these AI models, that's what it is. You give them input, it gives you output, right? And the same goes for mid-journey. You say, I want a picture of a cat surfing, and it, it spits it out for you. All right, but at the root of large language models and text, it's just next word prediction, right? This is the magic, this is the thing that's kind of scary to me. Well, not scary, but it's fascinating to me how these things work, right? Um, because at the end of the day, large language models like ChatGPT do amazing things. They do, uh, they do things that seem like, um, like an actual intelligence, but at the end of the day, underneath the hood, all it's doing is next word prediction, which is kind of insane, right? Because this is the equivalent of, uh, this is the equivalent of iMessage, <laughs> right? When you're on your phone and it's looking at the next word, that's kind of what it's doing, which is kind of mind blowing to me. But anyways, let's go back. So I gave it this sentence and I said, please complete this sentence. This is an AI model, right? And I, and I said, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great, and it gave me the word fall. But it also gave me a couple other op options and I'll be more clear, but here 97.7% chance that the next word on this sentence was gonna be fall. So I'll give you, this is a better one. This is more clear. I said, make a three sentence story about a hacker meetup, and it gave me the whole thing. But the word monthly, when it reached that, those were the options that it had, right? It gave me the percentages of what's the likelihood most, what's the word that's most likely gonna happen next, and it had the option to be annual, monthly, regular, secret, or weekly, right? Now, the interesting thing is where does it get those percentages and where does it get all that information? That's where the training comes in. That's when it kind of decides what word is most likely to be next. But isn't that amazing that the fact that like, it, all it's doing, all this chat GPT functionality is based on next word prediction, which is insane, which is pretty cool, I, I think. And like I said, iMessage is the thing that started all, I guess. Uh, so how do they work at the end of the day, right? So it's three main components. You have your data, uh, your transformer, which is a neural network, as we spoke about earlier, and then your training. Making these models uh, understand and learn, that's the training process. So that's the three components that comprise a uh, large language model. So let's start with transformers, which is a neural network, right? It's part of the deep learning part of, of artificial intelligence. So transformers um, are kind of like the big novel thing that came out uh, and is kind of like the thing that started the Gen AI craze, right? Or it didn't start it, but it's one of the things that contributed largely and made people pay attention to this. This was uh, from a paper in 2017 by Google um, called Attention is All You Need. And this was a new novel uh, um, neural network that was presented by these researchers in this white paper. And basically what they did, they did two things that were different than the previous neural networks that we were using. Um, and this is what kind of caused everybody to kind of switch to this neural network. And like I said, this is kind of like the start of what, you know, was happening with um, all this JI, general AI stuff. Is that, well this, this paper, all right. <laughs> They're mad at me for uh, talking about AI. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, this, this paper des was designed for like translations to translate into different languages from English to like French or something. Uh, but uh, the re when researchers, they, they found that this model was, uh, this neural network was a lot more efficient. Um, it had something called self-attention where it would recognize the context of where the word is compared to the other words in a sentence. Other neural networks were not aware of that. So it kind of understood the placement of the word when you had it in a sentence, which was kind of new uh, and, and, and really exciting. Um, it also was able to be trained a lot more efficiently than the previous ones, uh, because in the previous neural networks, they had to go train by individual one word at a time, where like for these new uh, transformers, um, it was taken in whole sentences. So that means that the, it was way more efficient to train these, meaning that it could be done a lot faster. Um, and again, this is where the GPT, the T is transformers. That's, that, that's what that means. So at least you guys took away that from this. When people ask what's ChatGPT, you'd be like transformers. Uh, <laughs> uh, so an artificial neural network. Uh, this is, uh, is kind of like the magic of how it all works. And this is when people say, you've heard this, right, many times when people say, they don't know how it works. They don't know how it works. It's a black box. This is what they're talking about, the hidden layers. And I'll talk about what that is. And you'll see it in, in right now. But basically, um, it, you give an input, like I said, it does its thing, it does something, and then it gives you an output. In our case, for us, it's the next word that's likely gonna be there, like on the sentence. Uh, so what this does is, you get an input, you give it to it, it starts processing, it passes into the next layer. All these like rows of nodes are what we call layers. 
It does a, a mathematical function on each of those nodes, and then based on the results, it passes it on to the next uh, layer, and it goes on and on into the output. Now, I'm gonna show you guys. I know it sounds kind of hard, but basically all you guys have to know is you have it in, it does some sort of mathematical equation, uh, and then it spits out what the output is. So basically this, right? So what, what kind of image is this? It's a dog, right? And, and all you guys, that's all I want you guys to take away. You don't have to worry about the math of how it works on the, underneath the hood. Just know that this is kind of what the neural network does, right? And because at the end of the day, like finding out how these neural networks work is a lot of like math and um, something that is gonna require a lot more time. This is just an introductory kind of thing. I just want you guys, neural networks, they take input, do some magic with those hidden layers, and you get the right output. And I'm gonna go a reason a little bit of how that works. Okay, so this is, um, before you feed stuff into the transformer, you don't just feed text into it, right? We give it a prompt, but it has to be changed in a way that's understandable. Um, it turns text into tokens. This is when you see ChatGPT, they charge you for token use, right? Uh, this is what it is. It basically takes the text that you provide and chops it up into smaller fragments. Uh, those are called tokens. And this is so that it can be changed into another thing later on in the neural network, but this is the first step. So the first step is tokenization. So tokens are not word for word, right? It's not just broken up in that way. It's combined into different things. For, for example, the B-sides description that I put on here was broken up into 75 tokens. Um, and keep in mind that these, this tokenization process is not standardized. So each different model handles the breaking up of these in different ways. So if you break it up in like, you, you broke down a, um, a piece of text, it might be like 75 tokens here for ChatGPT, but for Olama it might be like 80 or 75 or 70 or something like that. It might be different. And this, this, this goes the same for images as well. Images could be broken down by pixel. All right, so after you break things down and you break them into tokens, then you have to change those things into something called embeddings, which uh, embeddings are just an array of numbers, right? However, the cool thing about this, and this is the thing that kind of blew my mind when I was researching this, is that this is how the models um, kind of give meaning to words, right? And how they have like, that's kind of how the, the model kind of understands what words mean, which is insane to me, right? So for example, here in these pictures, you have an array for uh, the embedding for the word food, right? And then foot and burger, those are all arrays, right? Those are the embeddings of those words. Um, so in a, from a dictionary perspective, the word food and foot are kind of closer together. If you put them all in right, like they're kind of, but there is no relationship. There's no, there's not really anything there unless you're really kinky. But like, like, there's really no relationship at all, right? But food and burger, there is one, right? There's like, there's, there's, it's food. It's something that, it, there has to be a relationship to that, right? So it's cool that these embeddings turn these into the arrays. And that, that's the part that I'm gonna research more and that's gonna be my next talk to really understand how these embeddings kind of like talk to each other. I don't know where these numbers come from, but all I know is that for some reason, these embeddings actually give meaning to words, which is crazy to me. Um, Oh, before I go that. So these embeddings, also you can kind of think of them as coordinates, right? If I tell you, if I give you a coordinates for like latitude and longitude, and I, you're gonna end up in a city, right? If I say, what's the, lat what's the coordinates for New York? You can give me that based on coordinates. Think of that as well for these embeddings, right? Because if you look at a multi-dimensional vector space, these are all words, and they're kind of put together in like a, not, like not even in a map plane, but like in this space, all these words are based and coordinated upon the embeddings, all those numbers that we saw previously. I have a really cool demo that I think you're gonna like in a little bit that kind of goes deeper into this. Give me one second, just checking my phone. Okay, so one of the things that blew my mind when I was doing this, and, and again, this is, you're gonna see a lot more of this in a little bit, but when you like, I looked at the embedding for the word king, right? And then you can see kind of here, it's kind of bigger than the other ones. But like all these other words let up in the vector space. And it's because there's a relationship with the word king, with like Henry, author, brother, son, all these other words have a relationship and they're kind of related in this vector space, right? It's hard to see because we, we can't comprehend multi-dimensional space like this. It's too big for us to understand. But like, um, and I'll, in the demo that I'll show in a little bit, you're gonna get a clearer picture of how these words kind of are intertwined together through those embeddings. All right, so whenever you guys hear about people talking about ChatGPT and these new models, they always talk about like, this model has billions of parameters, right? And this model was trained on a trillion parameters or whatever. The parameters are basically the connections between the nodes. That's all you guys have to know. So the weights and those numbers 
Remember when the image was processed through the neural network, it goes from one layer to the next. Um, in order for to understand which nodes of those are going to turn on and turn off, um, the weights have to be adjusted. And they, they are then, that's what we call the train. I'll go into that in a little bit. But basically, all you guys have to know that every like line between the nodes, that's are the parameters that are being like counted. When, when people talk about like our model has, you know, is training on five billion parameters, that's what they're talking about, all those connections. Um, <coughs> keep in mind the biases in there too. Okay, so I'm gonna go deeper into this a little bit, but when you're training a model, you, you show it examples of what you want the output to be, right? And then it, if, it, if it gets it wrong, it looks at the difference of how wrong it was, and then goes through a process called backward propagation, which adjusts all those parameters that we talked about in the past. It kind of modifies them so that the next time it goes around, it's actually closer to what you want. And that's how it does the learning, right? Um, you give it a pass, it goes through the neural network, that's forward propagation. If it's wrong, it adjusts itself through backwards propagation. And it adjusts all those settings, all those weights, to make sure that the next time it gets that similar thing, it's actually understands it, it's better off. That's the training process in a nutshell. All right, so when I was learning about this, the thing that like stuck in my mind was that like you're basically tweaking a bunch of settings every time you do this, right? Every time you do a, a, a training session, you're tweaking all the settings, all those connections, you're adjusting them a little bit until you get it just right. And that's kind of what I kind of saw in my mind, just like lots of dials, lots of uh, like things that you fine tune and you, like you, you adjust every time you train. All right. So let's talk about the data. So for training data, what is, how are ChatGPT and all these large language models trained? Well, they're trained on like what they say, like um, you know, large data sets, right? The whole internet. People talk about this was trained on the whole internet. Um, so that's kind of things that it's trained on, just uh, text data, books, articles, web pages. Um, I think ChatGPT um, was trained, uh, ChatGPT3 was, was trained on a data set called OpenCrawl, I believe that's what the name of it is. And it's just billions of web pages. Um, and the larger the data set, the more accurate the LLMs tend to be, right? So that's why everybody wants more and more data. That's why people like Google are, are like transcribing YouTube videos just to get that extra text just because they can't get enough because the bigger the, the training text, the, the better these LLMs perform. So here, this is something that's really interesting as well. When I was researching, this is why people get so kind of freaked out about AI is that they found out, they saw that the more connections that we had, right, those collections, those parameters, the more things it was able to do. So when you had a smaller uh, set of parameters, it was only able, it was really bad at certain things. But then the more parameters that you gave it, and the more data that you gave it, and the, more, the larger the neural network was, uh, the more it was able to do. So then the, the thinking is, well, if you keep giving more and more, what else can these things do, right? Because it's able to do a lot more things based on how big these, um, the, how many parameters do we have? So that's why people are kind of afraid of it. Now, there's other people that disagree with this and say that we're going to reach like, it's not going to mean that like just because you keep expanding the, the, the many connections that you're going to be able to have like general intelligence. But, you know, that's kind of like why people are kind of paranoid about this because they see the pattern. Okay, so let's talk about training. So training is, is broken down into two pieces. The first piece is uh, pre-training, which is basically what we talked about, right? Where you give it all this raw text data, and then you pass it through the neural network a bunch of times. It figures out if it's right or wrong, and then adjusts itself accordingly through back propagation. And then it, uh, it adjusts all the dials, right? That's the pre-training phase. That will give you a foundational model. Basically something that just does the thing that we talked about, which was the next word prediction, right? Those are, that's the first stage. But then you're asking me, how does it do the whole ChatGPT thing where it's like an assistant? where you interact with it and it gives you answers. Because remember, if you ask a pre-trained level one uh, model a question, it's just gonna give you like the next, it's not gonna know how to act. So then the next thing that it does is called fine tuning, which is level two, which is you feed it data still, but you give it a certain format. If you guys go to Hugging Face, which is a site that deals with large language models and all kinds of AI models, they have a data set there called uh, Open Orca, I believe. And it's basically like questions and answers, examples, like five gigs worth that you use to train it with, and this is how it actually knows to become an assistant, right? Because you give it the instructions. Hey, you're an assistant, this is a question, this is how you're supposed to answer. And you do this and you train it over and over again until it kind of gets that kind of like personality or fine-tuned personality so that it becomes an assistant. This is how ChatGPT and all the chat box work. Um, what companies like Meta, Meta have done, 
uh, they give you the foundational model. So then you can do the second part, the fine tuning, to customize it to your needs, which is pretty nice. It's pretty cool. All right. Another part of fine tuning um, is the human uh, feedback, which basically um, it'll ask you give a, a, a request. It'll give you two answers, and then you pick whichever one you, you, you like best. And then it'll use that in its next data set for when it trains, because it'll have like, hey, if they like this, this answer and response, uh, let's use it on our next training run. And then the next uh, version of uh, the whatever model you're running is gonna be a little bit more accurate, because it has feedback from humans that gives it more data. All right, so this is, <laughs> this is uh, again, this is part of level two, which is alignment. Uh, and this is, a, this is the really complicated part about these models, uh, is that, um, remember, these things are trained on like the, all the data from the internet, which means that there's like data that's not safe, obviously, how to build a bomb, like, you know, how to break into a car, all that information is out there. And these models can't tell the difference. They just answer the questions that you give them, right? Because it does that next word prediction. So what they have to do is they have to give it, do the fine tuning, but they have to give it restrictions. They have to kind of put the handprints, right? Um, and this is where you have the, the, you know, when you ask GPT to make, like, how do I make a bomb? It tells you, like, I can't answer that. This is how this process is done, right? By just giving it, uh, like, answers and questions that it's not supposed to answer, right? So basically, you're training more and more just not to give you wrong information. The problem with this is that alignment is subjective, right? What's right for me might be wrong for you, and there's people who will end up have freedom to, like, just ask it whatever. So it just depends, like it's, it's very subjective. It's not an objective thing, it's really hard. And this is a whole field of study that is really fascinating, right? Uh, because at the end of the day, we're instilling our values into the latch language model because we tell it what to agree to say yes, and what to say no to. It's a very difficult problem. Um, and they do this, again, with synthetic data. So like they feed it questions or responses that are fake, right? This is where you got to see, um, there was like an uproar tweet like on, um, to correct like, for biases and stuff, this is where you saw like Google, you had like somebody Googled and said, give me the picture of the president, it was like a black president, right? It was because they fed a lot of synthetic data in there to correct some biases that are in like the uh, language model naturally, right? So it wasn't intentional or they weren't doing anything bad, they just tried to correct the bias and they, there's no way to do it, there's no saying that they can turn. They have to do it by feeding in lots and lots of training data. Again, this is the level one when you don't have anything that's, um, you haven't fine-tuned anything, that's the foundational model, and then you can customize that to uh, domain-specific in, in um, the second part, the level two, and that's what'll give you a more a specialized uh, model that you can use within your company, for example. If you wanted to use one that's focused on just your policies, that's gonna be aligned to whatever restrictions that you have in your environment, just, you would do that at level two. One takeaway that you guys have to, and I'm pretty guys, you guys already know this, but like training is really expensive, right? Training these models, like for level one, it's super expensive. Like it takes a lot, it, it really requires a lot of customized GPUs, and it takes millions and millions of dollars to do this. Um, so it's just for context, uh, Llama 2, this is the training data for Llama 2 that's on screen, but for context, Llama 2 was trained on 6,000 GPUs for 12 days, and it cost upwards of $2 million just to train that model. So it's really expensive to do that. However, after you do the initial training and you finish with level one, the processing that and, and doing just the querying and dealing with the chatbot itself is super, like, not expensive at all. The second part is called inference. So that part is not hard and it's not really that. It's processor intensive, but it's not too bad. So um, what they do is they give you the, all, a model that's trained on level one and then you can fine tune it to your liking. And, and that's really, that's a nice thing to do. And you guys can see here, Llama 3 was trained on 7.7 .7 GPU hours. So that's a lot of time. I'm pretty sure that costs a lot more money than GPT, I mean, than Llama 2. Okay, so let's talk about prompt design. So we talked about the data, we talked a little bit about training, we talked about what LLMs are. Let's talk about how you interact with them, right? There's a prompt engineer, so that was a, a, a job that got, you know, that got popular recently. I don't know if it's still a thing or not, but, um, okay, so. When you go to ChatGPT or any of these chat boxes, um, it, it'll talk about tokens. Remember we talked about tokens in the way that phrases are broken down, right? Um, so one of the things that's really important when you talk about a large language model and you, are not, and you interact with them is to learn about what the size of the context window is, meaning how many tokens or how much text can you put in that, talk, in that context window. And that does a lot of great things for you because um, it'll remember what's in the context window, right? 
So if you have a, a conversation on ChatGPT, and if you keep going and keep asking questions for it, it'll forget what you wrote at the very beginning if, it, if you go past the context window, because it's only gonna remember, and it's only gonna have in memory the stuff that's in the context window. So like, for example, I think GPT-4 has a 32,000 token context window, so that's a lot of text, so that's really good. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, for prompt engineering, one of the, uh, there's four concepts that you guys should be aware of. So when you talk about um, customizing and your better prompts to get better results, remember these things are, are made with like natural language. So the way that you interact with them is, is, is how you connect and, and make these prompt requests. I think of this as kind of like Google dorking, right? So for example, if you, ask, if you go to Google and you put in a query for a website, it'll give you the results, right? However, you can customize that Google query and get specific information if you're looking for PDFs or anything like that. You can kind of think of uh, prompt engineering in a similar context, right? Where you, if you give it context and you say, hey, for this, pretend that you're an uh, automotive uh, specialist and then you ask it about car questions, it'll give you more specialized response in that context window. Uh, if you provide examples, which is called few shot learning, you can provide examples of what kind of responses you want, and it'll give you exactly that when it gives you the output. And also being clear and specific, is very important? So ChatGPT already does this. If you go to customize all your, your prompts, you can say, hey, for these, every prompt that you give it, it can have specific requests of what you want and how you want the output to be and how you want it to like uh, process your request. So this is basically just injecting a little bit of pretext to the questions that you ask to give you a more uh, customized response, which is really good. And that's kind of the basics of prompt engineering. Again, it's kind of the equivalent of Google Dorkin if you guys are into security. Okay, so this is a tool by Daniel Meisler. It's called Fabric, which basically uh, took, um, did a bunch of like, re uh, as you guys can see, like. Uh, prompt engineering, things that give them really good results like summarizing text, summarizing video, or anything like that. Um, these are basically pre-pended to any prompt that he puts into uh, ChatGPT, and it gives them like very specific responses, right? So on this one, it's just a uh, prompt to summarize text, but you guys can see that like it gives them really specific instructions, like what kind of text it wants, how it wants the instructions to be, how he wants the output to be. Uh, yeah, it's so just like, check it out if you have any chance, it's called Fabric has a bunch of these requests, and it helps you like streamline a lot of these uh, requests that you give into like these large language models. So keep in mind, again, this is the most important part. If you want to get the most out of this, it uses natural language, so it's not a program language that you interact with. You have to know how to probe these things and to get what you want. Um, okay, so next thing, how do um, how do we do how do we fix the problem of Let's say you wanna, you don't wanna send your data to ChatGPT, right? If you wanted to ask questions about your internal documentation, you don't wanna like send documents to a third party company because that could be potentially sensitive information. So the way that people uh, figured out the problem, the answer to this problem is called Retrieval Augmented Generation or RAG, uh, which basically what they do is they take all the documents that you want to have um, be in your queries that you wanna be able to like look from. So like either internal documents, all your books or anything like that you make those into tokens, and you make those into embeddings, and you put those in a database, which is exactly what we did earlier, right? We took that text, parsed it up, put it into an embedding, put it in the database, right? That database can then be used to be queried upon, so whenever you have a prompt and you say, hey, can you give me the information uh, for my internal password policy for my company, it'll go to the database, it'll go look, it'll do a search on all the text and all those embeddings that relate to your company's policy, It'll take that embedding, identify that, turn it into text, inject it back into your prompt, and then that way when you ask that question, hey, can you give me the policy for my company, it'll, look at, it'll put it in a context window, and now that text is in the context window. So now it's in the memory of the LLM, right? And now it'll know exactly what you're talking about, and it'll give you the answer that you want, right? So basically it's a way to do database queries on text that you have provided and turn it into embeddings, and then now you can kind of use that in your own local model. Which is pretty, I think that's pretty interesting. Okay. Um, okay, so there, it's, LMs are not perfect, obviously. There's a lot of stuff that um, is wrong with, like there's a lot of problems with LMs. The most well-known one is hallucinations. Remember, uh, this is just next word prediction, so it doesn't care that it's right or wrong. It just, like, it's just giving you a word that it think is the most likely thing that it's gonna be next. 
right, in that sentence, right? There is no sourcing for these things, right? Because there is no source. It's just giving you a prediction of, from all the text that it's consumed um, and, and looking at statistical, um, statistical uh, similarities in that text, it's giving you the next word. So there is no like source that you can probe for these things. Uh, math, logic, and reasoning. So a lot of people have uh, discussions about this. I'm not gonna weigh in on it, but people say that they're bad at math, logic, and reasoning. Other people say that they're not, that people are just not asking the right questions in the right way. So I don't know, it depends. It's still, I don't, I don't know which one, but people would say that that's a problem. Like I said, cost to train is a big deal, right? Getting these LLMs to perform efficiently is, is very expensive right now. Um, the training data that we use to train these things has biases, which is another big problem. Um, work displacement, people think that this is gonna automate a lot of jobs away, which is another big problem. Cybercrime, uh, you know, the big, the big thing that everybody's talked about is when you're looking at phishing emails, look for typos, look for, you know, common mis, like, pronunciation issues or something. That's not a, gonna be an issue anymore, right? With these things, we can pretty make really good, um, really realistic uh, social engineering campaigns. And then also the training that we use, the data, is copyrighted a lot of the times, right? So who owns that, right? Is that okay for the companies to take and kind of train upon? I don't know, right? It's, that's something that we still have to figure out in the courts. Is the data that we're using trainable and because it's copyrighted or not? Like, that's something that hasn't been figured out yet. Again, AI is upset that I'm giving you all this information. Uh, <laughs> All right, and then uh, these are the OWASP top 10 attacks against LLMs, right? We have prompt injection. Uh, I'm gonna guys show you an example of prompt injection, but these are the common attacks that, you know, are, are being used against large language models right now. Um, obviously, this is a very sort of new security field, so it's gonna get better and better if you guys are interested in this stuff. I would suggest contacting OWASP and, and trying to be a contributor because there's a lot of space for growth here. There's a lot of things for you to research. There's a lot of things to do because it's a relatively-ish, newish like, uh, field of study. And there's gonna be lots and lots of attacks as you guys are gonna see. So this is a jailbreak. Uh, I'm pretty sure, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but like there was a lot of jailbreaks, right? That happened uh, when ChatGPT came out and basically they, they were, basically the, the way that the jailbreak would, would say is like pretend to be uh, somebody that is reading a story to my grandma who's a cybersecurity expert, and then the LM would be like, oh, okay, so it's not real, this is a story, so it would give you all that information, right? Well, this is another cool thing that happened, is that like for this model, if you ask it the question, it wouldn't like give you the answer to the day, I can't do that, but if you just do a base 64 of that text and ask it that question, since it wasn't trained on that, it'll be like, oh, I understand what that question is, here you go, and we just give you the answer, right? So there's gonna be a lot, a lot of these types of like attacks that uh, are gonna be more and more common, right? Uh, another one was that if you, yeah, you would give it a, now you can upload pictures, right? So there's some that you could encode text and pictures that was like non-readable to the human eye, but the LLM model could understand it. So you could just give it instructions in the form of pictures. But that's another cool novel attack. Uh, so what does the future hold for these things? Uh, in my opinion, there's three things that are kind of like the, the next thing that are gonna be the future of these, for right now at least is agents. Agents are basically LLMs that behave and can command other aspects of your computer to do tasks. So for example, if you're a pen tester, you could say, hey, can you give me, uh, can you pen test this IP? It'll be like, sure, here's my pen testing methodology. And then it'll take those instructions and run Nmap, get the results, feed it back into the context window. And depending on what ports it's open, it knows what to do because there's a standardized methodology for pen testing, right? So it'll just follow those instructions that it knows already and just do those actions. So the cool thing about agents is that it just basically adds more and more functionality. Um, it's dangerous, but it's, it's gonna be the future, I think. Uh, Self-improvement, meaning that it creates its own synthetic data for training. So like, remember we talked about, um, we, use, we use data to train in level two, right? You use fine tuning. Well, it could create its own question and answers, right? To make itself better. Um, but you know, that's another thing for self-improvement. And then the last thing that's a big field of research right now is the thinking fast and slow. I don't know if you guys read that book, but basically it talks about how the human mind has two ways of thinking. One is very like um, intuition based, that's thinking fast. And then thinking too is where you actually sit down and focus. Right now, uh, large language models are kind of like in the thinking fast stage where they just give you the next word and they're not really thinking about anything or like they're not really taking their time. But there's a field of research right now that is trying to slow them down and say, give them more parameters where it can say, before you give me the answer, take a day or two to kind of really think about the possibilities and kind of like 
trying to force them into more of a, um, trying to make them think more about the problem and giving them more and more complex problems, right? All right, so um, there's this, uh, the guy that's the ChatGPT main security guy, I forgot, his name is Andre. I, I, I forgot his last name, but uh, apologies for that. But he came up with a really good uh, way to think about LLMs, which is kind of think of them as a computer. Right, so the LLM would be your processor, the RAM would be the context window, which is your prompt and all the text that you interact with. Uh, the file system, which is are the embeddings, right? Those are the words that we turn into those arrays. That would be your file system. The browser would be your Ethernet port, and then the input and output. But, and then the agents would use the calculator and the Python in, in interpreter uh, and the terminal, right? But I, I thought this was a really good way to think about it because it kind of makes it seem like these are actual computers and it actually kind of matches up really well with our ecosystem, right? Because if you think about it even further, there's closed models and open source models, right? So you have Llama, which is an open source, which is kind of like equivalent to Linux, and you have ChatGPT, which is a closed model, which is kind of the equivalent of like Microsoft or something like that. All right, so let's talk about, let's do a little demo real quick. So this is the tokenizer stuff that we talked about, uh, where you take these words, these uh, just sentences, and it turns them into uh, tokens. We talked a little bit about that earlier. This is, uh, I, I basically use this to kind of outline how every word, you kind of see how it's a different color. If you click on the word, it tells you what the options are for the next word prediction. So at a dark, dim, ding, <laughs> run down and secret. Those were all the options, and it just kind of went with uh, dim for this particular part of it. And you can kind of do this. This is actually pretty cool because it gives you like the percentages of all the words that I could have used and it gives you like why it went with this one. If you see the red ones, those are the ones that are like where it went, went rogue a little bit. It wasn't like the highest percentage, but it just kind of randomly picked one just to make it more um, more random. Okay, so it's an embedding. I mean, that's the next word prediction. Here's that, um, remember like I said, the embeddings think of them like coordinates. These are all words, but it's just, um, they're, they're all over the place. So I'm gonna use the, like I said, in the example that I had on the presentation, I'm gonna use the word king. And you guys can see, it's really hard to tell here, but you can see all these other words that are kind of lighting up, are kind of related to the word kings, like prophet, holy, judge, sons, daughters, I don't know why, but all these words basically, when they light up, means that there's some sort of connection between them and the embeddings. There's some sort of meaning that connects them together. And it's really interesting because you can actually do a word math, <laughs> which is actually pretty cool. Uh, so give me a second, I'll show you guys something. So if I give you like the word king, I'll show you like words that are similar, right? It's the same kind of idea there. But like, let's say we do Germany, oops. Oops. See if that works. Oops. Oh, well, that don't work. Let me try another one. So you can actually, so adding and subtracting the vectors, this is what a really cool thing about this, was that like if you subtract the word man from king, and then uh, you add that to woman, you get queen as the second choice which is kind of crazy if you think about it, right? Um, the fact that, that it was able to like identify that. So let's do another one that's kind of fun. Dog, park, and meow. Hopefully we'll get cat somewhere in this list. Yeah, so there's cat right here. And I don't know, I just think it's cool to do algebra with words, it's interesting. Uh, all right, one last takeaway before I let you guys go. Um, like I said, these foundational models uh, are, are really expensive, millions of dollars worth, and these companies are giving them away for free. So if you, uh, if you wanna go around and play around with these things, you can get uh, Olama, download it. It'll let you download the Llama 3 uh, open source model, and then you can use it and have your own um, chat GPT lo running locally. This is, I don't have the internet on this box, but you can have it, let's say, tell me a joke about Box. And now I have like a, a very powerful open source um, model running in my box locally. <laughs> there you go. So I suggest you guys go download this.
and have this in case the apocalypse happens, at least you have uh, your own chat, the world's knowledge in your computer that you can download for free and use it to survive. Uh, all right, thank you very much. That's my talk. Oh, yeah, go ahead.